We got to come equally as hard. You know what I mean? We both bleed red. Yeah. Military, civilian. Okay, 848. So, someone, who, someone who is in the military is Chuck. Yeah. And he, he, he might be able to speak to that. <laughs> I see his uh, reaction. I doubt it. <laughs> I, don't know if he, I don't know if he can. can. I think he would. Chuck, Chuck, you're a captain. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's like, no, no, no. Let's bring uh, Chuck Estev as the um, Office of Civil Defense Administrator on uh, this morning. Good morning, Chuck. Hey, good morning, Chris, Sabrina. Good morning. Angie. Thanks for uh, not uh, pretending to. I thought he was going to be like, "What Zoom invite?" I didn't. I don't ain't going on after that. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's just start there, Chuck. Man, I mean, you've been around the block. You know the the public health orders. You know the governor and, the, and this lockdown. Just just what's your take on it? I mean, you know, I stated this before in our previous interview that, um, you know, those uh, that that make policy and make decisions, uh, you know, it's just a lot to consider. And so I'm pretty sure that these decisions aren't made lightly and you're never going to, I mean, you, you heard, this is a, a lot of people say this, you're never going to please hundred percent of everyone. Right. And it's just not a very popular decision. No one wants to be kept cooped up in their house. But I mean, just speaking from my own military experience, and it's funny because I was talking to this, uh, to uh, uh, our new Homeland Security Advisor, the general the other day is that uh, we remember uh, prior to going into country, right? So we're, we are basically kept in this uh, huge facility and, and it's it's a huge tent, it's full of bunk beds and you pretty much have to go find your own bunk bed and you're kind of kept here for about seven to 14 days before you can catch a rotator going into country, right? And then the conditions there are, are, are less than desirable. Um, you have no privacy, you're not allowed to put any privacy curtains. And so, you know, I mean, it, I think it depends on, on what people are used to in terms of, of you know, their day-to-day -day life and their experiences. So, I mean, if I were to get put up in a quarantine facility, as long as it has a bed and showers, I'm good to go. But, you know, that may not be the standard of living or comfort for other people. So, I mean, it's it's just all, it's all very, uh, very subjective. Right. So You're you right. would be comfortable in a quarantine facility with blood on the, on the bed <laughs> sheets, uh, dirt on the kitchen, on the sink, uh, hair on the carpet. That's, that's good. That's okay for you. For, for me, when you're in a tent with 30 other dudes and some of them are too lazy to go to the restroom, so they pee in old Gatorade bottles <laughs> and a small like feed all the time. I mean, that's just that's just me. But just to let you know, uh, um, you know, every time we receive these complaints, we actually do continuous walkthroughs with the vendors and we do catch some stuff with our subcontractors. And and those issues are, no, you know, public health, they're notified and they do put the vendor, the subcontractors on notice. And so sometimes when it when it deals with food or laundry, it's not not necessarily the the vendor, but it's just those they subcontract. Mm. And so they've they've been put on notice. Um, but I, you know, we've gone into the rooms and what people think are blood stains are actually, you know, just paint uh, paint chips. You know, they <laughs> That's paint okay. Over. Then. Yeah, and that I mean, well, it's I'm saying it used to be an old paint job and then it kind of peeled and now it looks like like blood splatter in there, but yeah, yeah. It, it, like I said, it's, you know, the, the cleanliness of sheets and the service of food, you know, it's, it's, it's no excuse, but I mean, like I said, some people are just used to different levels of comfort. Right. You know what? I kind of uh, was laying in bed last night, uh, Chuck, and I, I kind of really for the first time thought about what it would be like if I had to stay in my room for 14 days. And I don't know why I never thought of that before. Mm -hmm. This is because we're processing so many other things, but I would go freaking crazy. Yeah. I would. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. You're right, Chuck, that we have to make these decisions and people's lives are going to be hurt. People's feelings are going to be hurt. People's way of life is going to be hurt. You're right. There's just no way to make a decision where everybody's going to be fine with it, especially when it's a matter of life and death. And I think that's where we're kind of at right now, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we've, you know, just, just based on experience, right. We've experienced this where, where someone messes it up. I'll give you an example. Uh, um, someone goes on Liberty. They don't come home uh, uh, by the time um, uh, they're told to report back uh, either to the base or, or whatever the case may be. And this, just because that one person messed it up, you know, it's, it's, uh, they have to, t they have to do whatever they have to do to ensure that everyone follows the rules and everyone's safe. Mm -hmm. Who's but like I said, these are these are policy decisions. They're they're really above what we do here uh, in emergency management. 
Um, I do know you got you folks uh, did want to talk about the uh, the uh, blue med tents, the Alaskan structures. Yeah. So so where are we with that? When we talked to Lillian uh, last week, she was mentioning that there was some meeting where the governor ordered that these blue med tents uh, be ordered. Yeah. So so right now uh, the uh, the bid for those, or at least the request for quotes, uh, it was published in the paper, and that ends today. And so after that, um, we'll be working with general uh, GSA basically to uh, see who all the, uh, um, or see who submitted all, uh, submitted for a quote and to determine if they met the uh, specifications as listed in the quote. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we, uh, we actually uh, um, continue through the uh, procurement process. Okay. And what's uh, from awarding to, mm -hmm. to, to working uh, to get it shipped over here uh, to storage. What's the capacity for those blue med tents? So they're 10 tents uh, and they're, um, uh, well, it's a hundred bed capacity, right? So uh, they're 10 tents with uh, 10 beds in each. 10 tents with 10 beds. So each tent right. is, has a capacity of 10 beds. Right, right. Okay. but but the, the specs, um, the, we're looking for an all um, inclusive package. So it needs to come with its own environmental control unit. It has to have negative pressure ISO. Uh, it has to come with the beds, the flooring, uh, so it's not just tents. A lot of times when people think tents, it's like, okay, great, you're going to put people in tents, right? But um, this is, you know, a very field expedient, uh, supposed to be rapidly deployable, something that we can just put right there connected to the hospital, and then we've automatically added additional capacity to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I know uh, um, we received a lot of criticism asking why not use the military tents, but, you know, it, it's, it's also about building local capacity, right? We don't want to have to depend on someone for future events, future emergencies. And, you know, COVID-19 is not the only infectious disease out there, right? We still have other, I mean, we just we just got over dengue last year, right? So, it, you know, we, we don't know what's next. And so we can't, we cannot expect that the level of, uh, of threat or level of the emergency is going to warrant federal support you know, warrant uh, yeah. um, uh, military support, right. mm -hmm. and um, so by having these these tents, I'm just saying it's 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 good to to have this local capacity. How much are uh, these uh, medical tents? Uh, so I mean, we have a a budget, but until we actually get uh, the request for quotes in, um, it'll really be dependent on 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 who submits and and the price they submit. What's what's the budget? Uh, so so we estimated it to cost around you know 950k plus for 10 tents and the equipment that goes along with it. Absolutely. Okay, um, so it sounds like you're saying, okay, military, uh, keep your tents. We're gonna order our own tents. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, uh, and only because the tents that they've offered uh, are not negative pressure ISO. Mm -hmm. What about, so it's just, what, what about the field medical, uh, the tents that FEMA has? I understand they have two FMS field medical stations and each with Correct. bed capacity. So those, so those uh, federal medical stations are, are currently in the plan as well, right? So um, there's a need to have uh, these isolations, right, these tents, and then also for um, uh, bed capacity. So the federal medical stations are, ju are just beds. It comes with a, a small cache of supplies, very, very small. And they're actually meant more for a congregate type of setting. Mm. Right. So we would actually put all these beds and say a field house, a ballroom. And so it is actually for a, for a different uh, need. Like maybe homeless? Uh, no, not necessarily homeless. I mean, so, so the capacity that we're building is for your, your low acuity. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a medical expert by any means, you know, this, a lot of this stuff is, is, you know, we've learned, um, and a lot of the jargon we've learned. Uh, just by working uh, uh, the response uh, and recovery operations for this event. Okay, so could you explain that? Because I'm not sure what you just said. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So, Sorry. You yeah, said exactly. something about I'm acuity? Saying, <laughs> yeah, it, and I don't, you know, and, and, and so it, it, it depends on, you know, that little chart. Uh, are you feeling sad on a scale of 0 to 10 or really happy? So I guess it depends on the symptoms and how you're feeling, right? You know, are you, do you have a lot of symptoms? Are you asymptotic or? <laughs> no, you didn't. Oh. No, you didn't. <laughs> and it's asymptotic, yeah. okay? <laughs> no. The thing is, it's it's it it you know, and and there there is a there's public health, 
that on the public health side, there's GMH um, uh, with their other uh, partners on the medical services side. Uh, we have the physician advisory group, the cure action team, the state surgeon cell. So there are a lot more medical professionals out there that, that get together and make these decisions on, on what capacity we need. Okay, our so job in the EOC, our job in the EOC is to coordinate for these these resources. So if they say that uh, they need you know bed capacity, then we're going to work to get bed capacity. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we have to do um, is ensure that uh, we do our best locally as a territory to get this capacity. And if we can't get this capacity, and it's a true emergency, and if need be, then we would ask help from FEMA. GRM. A lot of times people think that it's it's automatic help, that FEMA's here, uh, you know, the military's here, and that the help is automatic, and that's not always the case. Um, sometimes it comes with a cost share. Uh, sometimes it comes with uh, additional questionnaires, and that's only because it, it's, you know, all responses are local. Mm. All emergencies are, are local. Yeah, local, but locally and locally executed. So, so the field medical stations, they're, they're currently on island, these two tents, 50 bed capacity each. What would be the cost share if we were to use them? Would it be no, more than the, 900? Uh, actually, the, the federal medical stations uh, were, were, were deployed to us and given to us um, at, at uh, um, no cost share from what I'm tracking. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so they're, we... they're actually, yeah, so they're actually just beds. They're, they're deployed to uh, states and territories uh, for our use. Um, but the, the actual tents that were the blue med elastic structure tents that we're trying to get, um, you know, it meets a different capacity, right? It has the negative pressure ISO that prevents the recirculation of contaminated air. I see. But with the federal medical stations, which are just beds, and I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, I can share a link with you guys uh, after this, but but they're basically meant for a more of a, a congregate uh, type of a, a setting. Mm -hmm. What about, um, I wanted to follow up on uh, isolation facilities. You know, the days in, I think that's the only government isolation facility. And as we see the numbers that continue to rise, one can only assume that we could see um, more numbers of people who may need to go in isolation. And so I think the last numbers from the JIC, the number of cases in uh, active cases, I believe, have now surpassed the number of recoveries. So is the government looking toward securing another government isolation facility? Yes, yeah, so uh, we are actively looking for another isolation facility um, and or uh, consolidating into a, a larger facility. I'm pretty sure you're tracking that over the weekend. Uh, um, the governor made this, uh, this the request uh, and decision uh, about a week ago to look for a consolidated quarantine facility. So we've been working that. Um, we currently do have a, uh, a, a consolidated quarantine facility over at the Ducet Beach, uh, formerly known as the Outrigger. Uh, you know, Chuck, what, I... what is that? A consolidated? Is that a you have a mix of quarantine and a mix of isolation? Uh, no, uh, just uh, a, a consolidated quarantine facility. So what is that? I just, like, yeah, so it's, it basically is taking uh, both the quarantine facilities um, that we have right now actually the three quarantine facilities at the Ocean View and Garden Court, the Bayview and the Wyndham and putting them into one facility. And then get, getting rid of the, the other ones, just putting them correct. Okay. And, correct. And, and there's, there's a couple of um, factors that, that led to this decision. Um, you know, one is uh, um, after August 21st, we did lose our, our hundred percent cost share for the national guard. Um, so, um, you know, there's there's some fiscal restraints there as well because uh, for every guardsman that we bring on, we have to basically pay 25%. Uh, additionally, um, uh, you know, just less uh, manning and staffing, uh, running multiple facilities when we can just consolidate that into one as well. So, are we still going to see the National Guard once this uh, consolidated uh, facility over at the Outrigger is up and running, or is the National Guard no longer going to be? Uh, helping run that facility or are we going to see the return of like gov guam directors and deputy directors what, what are we talking no, about the, so the national guard they're they are still running they're still the facility managers okay and when are we uh planning to see that contract is it going to be a contract or is it going to be like a superpower decision it's a uh, purchase order and i can go to forge you guys a copy okay so we're not doing any more emergency health powers act uh emergency purchases 
Yeah. So, so, so because, you know, we actually, when we had that lull, it's, it's good because we had some time to do some uh, more uh, deliberative planning, um, kind of go through uh, just some of the processes that we have here in the uh, lease on the emergency management side. So um, we do have a purchase order for the consolidated facility and we can go ahead and sh uh, shoot that over. Thanks. Mm -hmm. What's the budget for that? Uh, so uh, we started uh, initially uh, uh, the PO with uh, at 200K. And then if need be, um, you know, we would submit an amendment to, to increase it. For how many uh, rooms? Uh, so it's a minimum of 300 rooms, but the outrigger has a maximum of 600 rooms. And so so the, the purchase order is for, for 300 rooms, but if we need that additional capacity, then that's where we can work amendments. We can work with the vendor as well right. uh, mm -hmm. to, to build up to that capacity. Is that for a and month? So, let's say again. Is that for one month? Because I know that the the current contracts aren't they like in a, a one month interval, correct. thirty day interval. Yeah, correct. That's for one month. Okay, so two hundred thousand dollars for three hundred rooms for thirty days. Correct. With the option to renew every month. Uh, correct. Okay. Chuck, I actually just got a call from a lady whose daughter was moved from Bayview over to Outrigger, and uh, just so you know, I asked for her info because she had said that. They're very happy with the conditions at Outrigger and the food has been great. And so I told the lady, we haven't had a really good quarantine story. So maybe tomorrow. Yeah. I don't want to <laughs> jinx it though. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> yeah. And, and just to let you know, uh, um, uh, surprise is just to let you know that the vendor for the Outrigger uh, is the same vendor for the Bayview. And uh -huh. so if they're complaining about, if they complain about the food at the Bayview, and the garden court, I mean, it's the same vendor, you know, so <laughs> just, wanted to, just wanted to say that. To Maybe they put that. more but, Aji in the. <laughs> yeah, but just, but the pictures that we've seen from the facility, uh, the food that we've seen from the facility, I mean, you know, we're, we're very pleased, but just to let you know that, that um, we had a, we have, we had a great uh, uh, working relationship with the Wyndham uh, Hotel as well. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of the complaints that we had, we went there, we validated the complaints. And we were very happy and pleased with the services that they provided. I mean, you know, to be honest, there are a lot. There were there weren't a lot of the hotels that that wanted to be quarantine facilities, uh, to, you know, at the start of this event. Right, right. And so they were one of the the first. And you know, we're really thankful for the uh, the service they provided. How many people are in quarantine right now? Uh, I don't have the number off the top of my head. Uh -huh. And that's 300 regardless, 300 rooms at 200,000, regardless if all 300 rooms are being used. Uh, correct, but there is a, um, a uh, um, unoccupied rate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so, so a lot of that's listed in the, the terms of the purchase order, which okay. I can provide. And it, does the same uh, vendor, they provide the food and they provide the laundry services or is they it like separate the, purchase orders for those? No, they, they provide the food, the laundry services, uh, as well as the uh, the housekeeping services. Mm -hmm. But Outrigger is already uh, a, a, a contracted, right? Because you just somebody was just moved there. Correct. They're under a current. Okay. Correct. Anything else you guys are procuring or working on? <laughs> um, well, I mean, besides the Blue Med tents and Casadi quarantine facility. The isolation facility, the continued need for for PPE. Oh yeah, yeah. There was something, Chuck. I wanted to ask about the uh, transport. Um... American Medical Transport. I think that's the name of it. I, we've been hearing that supposedly they had been providing medical transports between um, uh, the the quarantine facilities to so the isolation facilities, and something suddenly they stopped. Do you know anything about that? I, I'm not sure. I, I do know that. Um, um, the guidance was given to uh, utilize uh, because you know the, these the people that are moved between facilities uh, to the isolation facilities you know they have no symptoms right so a uh, decision was made to use uh, government transport and I believe uh, um, you know either public health uh, you know EMTs or, or folks from the National Guard uh, to to drive those uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. But were they being used? This company being used before. Um, I I, I'm not sure. I mean, that's not anything that we were tracking in the uh, in the EOC. What about the food uh, contract? Are we all good on that now? 
Uh, so the the vendors providing uh, food services. Okay. So that's it. That's included. Yeah. That's so that's included with the, uh, um, or that's that's provided by the vendor as a wraparound service. The hotel. Correct. Okay. Just real quickly, I want to follow up on that isolation facility. Where are you guys looking at? Or. Uh, so so it really depends on um, you know uh, who semester, we're basically their. Uh, well, we're going through the process with GSA, right? So. Uh, there's a number of options that we can take, but you know a lot of it's depending, uh, dependent upon you know which facilities actually want to be an isolation facility. Mm -hmm. Okay, have you guys looking at a deadline to secure another isolation facility? ASAP. Right. Right. A ASAP. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There you go. Good to hear. Um, I wanted to follow up also on the uh, situation with the E911 center. I know that you, when we spoke yesterday, you were saying that they're uh, like on another side of uh, the civil defense structure because it is a really big uh, facility. Do you know if there's, they've returned, uh, GFD and GPD have returned back to the building or are they still? Uh... Uh, yeah, so I, I, ha I haven't seen it. Um, you know, when you come down the stairs, uh, for anyone who's been in our facility, you know, they're on the right. Um, and actually the, there's a, you know, Kind of have to go through this little classroom to get there to their area and then you know we bust the left and we're through uh, uh through left this long hallway and then and then the emergency operations center is there so uh you know and we received some questions regarding this yesterday too and so it, just let you know between every shifts you know everyone every emergency management worker here every response activity coordinator every employee here as part of our safety guidelines in our instant action plan they sanitize their workstations uh, we do have a cleaning contract and they're here daily. Um, you know, uh, common areas are wiped down. Uh, we don't have any communal cooking here. Uh, same with any uh, communal um, uh, sharing of food either. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, we've taken a lot of measures here to ensure the safety and protection of the force. Uh, that... Additionally, we, we, we've allowed all our non-essential programs and workers to, uh, to telework. So um, really it's, it's those folks who are here are, are, are those that need to be here. Has anyone ever tested positive over at civil defense or homeland? Uh, so, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's protected information. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, yes. Right. But yeah. that was, uh, yeah. towards the, uh, the start of the event. I right. Can't name right. Any yeah. Name, name yeah. Details, but I mean, you know, just in all transparency, you know, the answer is yes. And, uh, fortunately that person, you know, was, um, you know, that person was secured and, you know, they, they did notify us. Uh, but but you know what's really important is that that if if and and our employees are really good about this is that if we even if if a person suspects that they came into contact or they know that it came into contact with someone positive um you know it, it's we hope that they would inform us and we hope that they you know we can give them the option to to telework right so we we don't want anyone to hide the fact and and think there's a stigma um, by associating with someone positive or becoming positive themselves, you know, and then risking, uh, the, the force by, you know, thinking that, that, you know, they're that essential that they need to come into work, you know, given the, the, the technology that we have today, there's, there's nothing that we can't really do over zoom or WhatsApp. Okay. Right. Right. Did you have any? No. Okay. Well, well thanks, thanks Charles. Charles. Yeah. Appreciate it. Nice chair, by the way. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Can you stand up? What is it? What is that? Like a gaming chair. Yeah. Also, what kind of chair is that? Speed racer. Yeah. So just to let you know, during some of the long term, uh, the other <laughs> type of emergencies, like the uh, the uh, the typhoons, were we're here and we're. <laughs> <laughs> this is where he justifies his puffy chair, guys. <laughs> just saying, yeah. It's no, just like the like, guy no, is, I, I, he slept in a tent with like, thirty no. dudes peeing in Gatorade bottles. He can have a puffy chair. <laughs> so so I, I did buy this chair myself. This is not a, this is not your government issued chair, right? Oh, the, the chair I had was squeaky. It, it, the uh, the shocks on it didn't work anymore. But the reason I got this chair is because it can go all the way back. So during those typhoon types of events, if I need to take a nap, I can take a nap Ooh, in my office, right? Nice, hey. nice, <laughs> fancy. All right. You deserve it, though. Yeah, right? man. Cool. Thanks <laughs> a lot, Charles. It, uh, thank you very much, and thanks for uh, helping us uh, to, to disseminate uh, uh, information. Right on. We had a comment in here about uh, thanking you for the transparency that uh, kind of puts uh, people at ease. And this is something Bree is just really, I mean, and thank God one of us is. She is just keyed in on what type of supplies we have. How are we planning ahead? What about the surge capacity? So thanks for uh, coming on and letting us uh 
fire away at you, Charles. Appreciate it. I, I mean, I didn't ask why are we just ordering these tents right now. I mean, yeah. why didn't we yeah. order them before? And then to let you know, so we we are not. Um, you know, a lot of the kudos does go to the the, the governor and the team as well because we're not the policymakers here. Right, right, right. We're just uh, does to execute and and we make recommendations too and give advice. But you know, a lot of these are our policy decisions. There is a a group. They meet daily. They meet constantly. They meet on uh, seven days a week, all all hours of the night, and you know they make these decisions based off of all the available information uh, that we have. And you know we're still learning a lot about this threat, right? So it's just not it's not something that 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 these decisions aren't easily made. And so I I personally wouldn't want to be uh, the one to make these decisions. Um, they're just hard decisions to make, and um, you know sometimes we we just have to 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 kind of take in the uh, the good with the bad, right? So. Um, I just want to say that this thank you all for your continued partnership as uh, um, our partners in, in communications. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thanks, See you. All right. Uh, 914. Hey, we're taking a short break. Coming back with the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association uh, next right here on the link. It's The Breeze 93.9. Good morning, Guam. GU Self Storage.